Uh, I'm Andrew Hillier. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Serba. Um, in the next two hours, hopefully you'll understand to a very deep level what Serba does and what we're all about. Um, I do want to cover the agenda uh, up front. As Steve said, just so you, if you have any specific questions, I know there were some questions that were, that were blogged earlier. Um, I'll try and get to all of them as best I can in the two hours. I'm sure the two hours will go by very quickly. Um, but this is the order that I thought we'd cover it in. Um, I know this is a very dense slide. Don't worry, they're not all this uh, wordy. I want to talk about just at a high level, you know, who we are, what we do, what problem we solve. Not, not so much who we are. We, we gave out an information sheet of, about the company, so you would have all received that ahead of time. And one of the hard copies has that as well. Uh, more around what we do, the kinds of companies that use Serba. I'm not going to talk too much detail. I'll talk about some customer case studies later on, but I'm not going to name a lot of names uh, in, in specifics in those areas. Um, and I'm sure everybody always likes to know how how we fit in or how we are different than VMware's products. So when we talk about what we do, people say, okay, well, tell me how it's different than these other products that are out there. So I'll spend a good bit of time on that in each of these sections. Um, so the first one is just kind of a high level, uh, you know, so some, some graphical versions of what we do. Then I'll get into the details. So I'll talk about the analytics under the covers to a certain level of detail. Um, we can dig deeper and deeper, but we'll, get, we'll probably use up all the time if we do that. So we'll try and uh, strike a balance. Um, specifically how it works with other things in the ecosystem, and then I'll, I'll do a live demo of the two parts of our product. One that kind of optimizes the infrastructure supply, you know, detailed VM placements, things like that, and another one on routing and reservation, making macro hosting decisions. And as we go through, you'll see there's kind of the two parts of our product that work together. Um, then I'm going to go into a little more detail on each of those use cases with some examples. So um, specifics of how we tie into cloud management platforms, process flows of how our customers use us in their automation workflows. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, things like hybrid cloud. I'm sure you know, that's a, the topic you all want to uh, uh, discuss. And then on the infrastructure side, um, just some examples of the types of savings that we see, uh, driving up density, optimizing software, software-defined networking, very interesting area for us. Some of our customers are, are uh, analyzing with our product. So I think it's a, a, a good set of, of content, and hopefully we'll get through it all. Um, but as Steve said, if you want to keep it very interactive, that's, that's fine. And uh, if there's any key points that, that we're going to miss, I'll just make sure we, we hit them at some point. Any questions about the agenda? All right, let's dig into the, the first section. Um, so what is Serba? Again, you have a piece of paper saying who Serba is. Uh, what are we? We're really analytics that look at application, the supply and demand, the data center, the, the, the apps, their, their demands, what uh, supply or infrastructure is running on. And we, we analyze that basically to drive up density, drive down risk, increase levels of automation. Um, and we're not an orchestration or provisioning tool. We're just kind of like a brain that thinks about stuff and says, you should do these things to get a much better you know, operational profile or lower risk or, or higher efficiency. And again, I'll go through all kinds of detail there. We do focus on fairly large companies. You'll notice in our customer list, there, there's some pretty big companies with some very, very large installs. Uh, we have installations going right up to almost 140,000 physical and virtual systems in one server. So it's a... Uh, well, one, one, one master server with report generators and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a very scalable architecture. Um, and we tend to sell to the bigger companies. We also have an indirect channel partners that take us to smaller companies as well, and they embed us in their clouds. Um, so we have a range of customers, but most of the ones I'll talk about are, are pretty large. Um, we have a bunch of very interesting global partnerships. So we have a very strong partnership with IBM. Uh, we do a lot of work with them in their, in, their, in their SO group, for example. They use our product to drive efficiency in their customers, in their, in their cloud builder program. Uh, we have a lot of different touch points with them. Uh, Dell uses us, HP uses us. Um, we're, we're pretty close with VMware. Again, people say, how are you different than VMware? We have, a, we have a lot of contact with them. We're actually working on some interesting integrations with things like VROPS because of what we do that's different than what they do, and they're actually quite complementary. So I'll try and get into as much detail as I can on that to uh, answer any questions. Yeah, what problem do we solve? I'll, I'll give a more detailed version of this in a second, but at a high level, again, it's, we, we use the word placement. Um, we're not a recruiting firm, not that kind of placement. It's how apps and VMs, where they land in the infrastructure, at the host level, at the operating environment level. You know, is it, is it, uh, does it go to OpenStack? Does it go to VMware? Those kinds of decisions. So where things go. And we've been saying this for uh, quite a while now. We've been evangelizing this notion for some time. I think uh, you know, recent um, advancements in you know, private cloud, public cloud, all these different technologies make this more and more critical. And I'll explain why I think that is. Um, but figuring out where something goes is, is something that is, is becoming so complicated. And, and the, the, the benefits of doing it right are so huge that it's becoming something that you know, we feel you definitely need to apply analytics to. You can't just use a spreadsheet 
and try and figure it out or leave it to some traditional capacity management group or some other group that's not really focused on that, on that area. Would you describe yourself as, um, <coughs> as a brokerage? Well, so we, we're careful not to use that word because I think in the public cloud space, people think of a brokerage as someone who's doing spot pricing and you want instance, you'll go there, you'll go there. We're, we're kind of a, one step back from that. We model all the different capabilities of all different offerings mm -hmm. and make routing decisions, but it'd be more like for a company that is, uh, as, you know, has two or three suppliers that are known suppliers with what they're providing you know, and what price that is, and then we would kind of make fit for purpose decisions within them. So, so brokerage, I think, sometimes connotes a, a kind of a very, very uh, uh, public spot pricing kind of, which, which we're not. Um, as far as who uses us, uh, again, these aren't, this is just a handful of, of companies. I'll step back so you can see the side of the screen here. Um, I, I mentioned we have some pretty large customers with some very, very large installations, and th this slide is just covering, we, we have a, an advisory conference once a year where, where we don't all get together, but those that can come, uh, this is you know, the list that made it last year, um, where we talk about these things, and it's a very, very serious discussion, it's very valuable for us, because we get to say, where are you, where, where actually are you with OpenStack? Like, how far along are you really? Are you, are you in production, or what are you doing with containers, or you know, it has, these type of things. So we can actually talk to them and figure out where exactly they are in their journey and we can provide, you know, exactly what they need. So for example, uh, you know, last year we heard a lot that people weren't really, uh, you know, deploying LXC yet, but they were seeing Docker. Uh, or that storage was a big pain for them. Even though there's all these kind of really uh, uh, hot topics right now, just give me better visibility in my physical storage. So, so we, you know, demand management is always a big thing um, in these discussions where we're going with that. And that, that really drives a lot of, of the R&D that we do and where we focus our areas because uh, I think, and I'm sure you're all, uh, you'd all agree that there's a lot of, lot of words thrown around, there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of hype uh, around technologies, but the, 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 the pace that they actually get deployed and used can look quite different than that. Um, so we want to make sure that we're solving the future problem and the current problem and kind of doing a balance of, of both. What's your go-to-market strategy? If I'm a customer and I want to put Cerba in my data center, uh, how, how does that work? Are you channel? Are you partnering with channel organizations, or how, how does that work? Are you sell directly? What's your What's your way of addressing your average customer? So most of these would be direct. Again, the larger ones we do direct. So a lot of times they would they would we would engage with them. They may try the software. They they might not. Typically they would, but more and more we're finding they don't because they can just do reference calls and and, and kind of get up the speed on that. Um, and we work with them. We have you know we can help them size it, deploy it. We have various service offerings. We also have a managed service that we can run it for them. So some of our customers do that. So we're saying, yeah, you want this, you want this uh, uh, um, functionality or this benefit, but you don't want to train up a group or whatever, we'll just take care of it for you. Um, and, and so we have different offerings that we can provide them. We also go through channel as well. So uh, a number of our large customers would be, for example, IBM customers, where they're the main interface point. Um, and and we, kind of, we kind of help IBM fulfill that, but they do all the deployment. So, uh, there's a couple of different models, but again, it's, 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 um, we're pretty, pretty flexible on that. And uh, we're looking more and more at managed service and even SaaS type offerings, although, again, data going offsite is always a sticky point with a true SaaS offering. So, you know, we're just kind of, uh, but in certain situations, like working through partners, that is possible. So, so and how are you licensed? Hmm? How do you provide licensing for your clients? Is it's, it? it's a subscription base, okay. and it's by volume and term. So okay. it's like a, a cell phone plan, or at least a North American cell phone plan, where um, you know, you can buy it for a thousand, you know, a, a VM or a physical server our target. You can buy it for a thousand for a year or 10,000 for three years or 120,000 for five years and the, the price drops down. Um, so that's, that's the way everybody, so you can use it for um, smaller or shorter term or larger term and the economics still makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the kind of the, the, what we see happening. Again, I, I mentioned we talked to all these customers, it's great feedback for us, and if, we were, if I were to try and characterize kind of the, the, the high level problem we're seeing, is that if you look at supply and demand, um, we're seeing all kinds of different sources of demand. Of course, everybody has a private cloud now um, where somebody can ask for a VM and it gets turned on right away, or 10 VMs or whatever they want. We still see that there's the need for enterprise app deployments. We have customers that say, I'm gonna deploy some SAP modules next month. I need to figure out how to do that, or I'm promoting this new app into production. So there's kind of the high velocity, you know, Gartner calls them mode two and mode one. There's the kind of the DevOps type of stuff or the faster stuff and the slower stuff. We still see everybody kind of doing migration projects. Everybody wants to get over into their new cloud. It seems like just when you think you've, you've migrated all the next gen, there's a new next gen or getting out of a data center. So these kind of bulk sources of demand and there's even the existing apps that are in an environment that, that I need to figure out what is the optimal thing to do with that. That app that's running in there, 
you know, it's been there a year. Is there a better place, is there a better way to host that right now than when I first deployed it? So we see this kind of, there's a, a pipeline of, of demand. There's stuff running, there's stuff coming down the pipe quickly, slowly, and that all creates a very complex set of requirements. And I'll go into detail on this in the demo. I'll show you, I'll, I'll drive right into that. Uh, what we call portable demand models. And so these things have very specific needs, storage needs, SLA, jurisdiction, location, whatever the case is. Um, and so that's kind of on the demand side. On the supply side, um, we see this kind of expanding portfolio of supply. So we, we see almost everybody now is kind of, uh, has both of these in some form. Uh, we also see mid-range in, in, in you know, a lot of the large organizations. We see on-prem bare metal as, as part of the cloud offering. So a lot of our customers now in their clouds, you can spin up bare metal or a virtual instance. Um, and that makes complete sense. So this starts to map out a set of capabilities that can vary quite widely based on what you're pointing at. You know, some of them might have restrictions on how big the VMs are, the type of storage they provide. Um, and the challenge we see is that it's going to be very, very difficult to link these two together scientifically. Again, we see people trying to struggle through with spreadsheets, like literally a lot of the big organizations have spreadsheets trying to figure out the, the hosting decisions that they're making. Um, <clears throat> you know, they might have VMware tools running down in that section for, for balancing VMs and things like that, but at the macro level, um, there's a lack of science around this, and it's only getting worse because we see containers and pads. And I just put a little note on these because some of these things are, are things that we're working on. They're not all out in our product yet. Um, but we see that coming into the mix. Um, you know, we've done an integration with Apprenda, for example, because PaaS offerings need to figure out how to use the actual infrastructure efficiently on the back end. Um, and these can, things can run on top of these other things. So they, again, it becomes a very complicated relationship. Um, oh, sorry. We also see um, off-prem bare metal. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work with IBM, and they have the software has a bare metal offering, which I find quite fascinating. I'll, I'll, I'll show some analysis of this uh, a little bit later. Um, and of course, Amazon and you know the, the public infrastructure as a service. So you have this wide gamut of hosting options that's kind of expanding all the time, and you've got this dynamic pipeline of supply that's only getting more dynamic, and it's getting worse and worse. So. This is kind of the way I would frame how we're seeing the, the, these challenges. And everybody, every one of our customers has three or four or five of these things at the bottom. And it's only going more. We have people saying, where do I put the next Oracle database? You know, or the next WebSphere app. So, so it's, it's all a, a very complicated placement challenge. Now, I mentioned under the covers, we've got, we've got app developers. And uh, um, you know, their, their, um, their goal is you know, agility and to get new services out you know, kind of uh, support the business as fast as possible. And we've got infrastructure managers who want to keep the lights on in the infrastructure. Um, and so you know, these developers or app groups, it doesn't have to be developers, um, you know, will create a new app or a new service and it has a whole bunch of different requirements. And, and uh, you know, some of our customers call this the manifest. Um, I think there might have been a video sent around of, of, of Bank of America CTO talking about uh, how, they, they just, how they have an app manifest saying this is what it needs. And the challenge is we don't want that, every time that happens, we don't want it to go to the person on the right and say, figure this out, because that's, that's, that's very inefficient and it's just a waste of time. You know, one of our customers calls this straight through processing. I want to be able to take that and just make a decision on it. And so that's where you know, we talk about codification. We want to be able to say, okay, for this set of requirements, let's set the ground rules of, of, what, of how we're going to make decisions on where it goes in the infrastructure. And it involves the people on the right, but once it's th done, then this can just happen in an automated fashion. So we may say, that, that service you're trying to stand up, that should go over here. That looks really funny with the, the wavy screen. Um, that can, should go over here, or it should go in your VMware environment. And, and I'll show you very detailed examples of this actual process flows uh, a bit later on. I might also have an app running in an environment, and that environment might be unhealthy, or out of disk, or maybe there's just a cheaper environment. Maybe my new, my new vBlock is a cheaper place to run it. So I also want to be able to take that and reanalyze it, and what we call reroute it. Say, well, that now should probably be somewhere else, or we're end of life in that environment, or whatever it is. So, so initial placement decisions, but also reassessing things and figuring out there's a better place for them. Um, and obviously, that can start to get into hybrid cloud routing and things like that. But just to, to, to ground it right now, even just to make sure that I can work around you know, environments getting full or have a constant way of, of making sure that I, I can make new decisions, because the, the metadata stays with the app. So when I have that manifest of what it needs and it lands in an environment, I can still take that later on and say, okay, now I can redecide somewhere else it can go, and I, I don't have to reverse engineer the application. So that's kind of the, that, that, you know, that's the, the, the um, almost demand management workflow where we need to make these decisions uh, to make sure we have automation and, and agility. Um, now, if we look under the covers of one of these, um, it, it's also very complicated, and probably even more complicated, because if I look at just now in a VMware environment, for example, and I've got a bunch of VMs running. 
Um, there's all different shapes and sizes. So I might have VMs that are CPU intensive or memory intensive or I.O. intensive or ones that have a start of day workload or an end of day workload or midday or end of month. Again, there's all kinds of different patterns that we see. Um, and the question becomes, well, how do I decide where to put these and how do I decide where to, how to combine them together to make the best use of, of infrastructure? Um, and to describe that, we, uh, you've probably seen, if you've seen our material, we use an analogy to the game of Tetris. Because it's actually a, a pretty good analogy. It holds to uh, you know, quite a few levels. And we actually found uh, workload charts that look like these Tetris blocks, just uh, FYI. Um, so you know, I might combine them in a certain way to say, well, if I put these two workloads together, they're going to conflict at 9.30 in the morning. But if I put these other ones together, then they'll, they'll dovetail and they'll make best use of, of my capacity. So we're starting to get into the, the analytics, you know, and, and I'll go much deeper into this, but by looking at the patterns and shapes, um, and, and not just responding in real time, but actually standing back and looking at all the patterns, we can, we can make a decision. Because if we look at an environment, if we go into a typical environment um, and look at the way the workloads are placed, they tend to look like this. Even if you're using all the, pro all the VMware products or, or, the, or all, you know, the, the complete suite of, of another vendor, what we find is that if you're just placing things based on five-minute data, then you will have, um, it'll only get so good. You, you'll avoid problems as they occur, but you might, at 5 p.m., you might have a uh, contention and you have to move something else. Um, so we see, you know, in, in a Tetris analogy, it's like having a lot of stranded capacity and a lot of operational risk. So I might have capacity that's going unutilized at certain times of day because it's just, there's no apps that, that are busy at that time. But then at certain times, other times of day, everything gets busy at the same time and I have contention and DRS will move something. So how often is your sampling period, and over that period of time as well, how do you capture the data? Do you look at the mean average, the peak only? What do you look at it? So I'll, so I'll go into that in some detail. And it, it's kind of on the previous slide. We do a full pattern analysis. Mm -hmm. so, so we'll gather quite granular data, but we typically do it on a daily basis. So we usually come in, sweep in after midnight, and say, let's take all the operational patterns of all the, all the workloads and analyze them and, and say, OK, now if we set up this way, we're ultimately set for the next operational cycle. Okay. And then we let DRS do its thing. And I'll, I'll go into that in some detail. So we will kind of strategically place things and then say, OK, now run and do your real-time thing. But DRS becomes much less active mm -hmm. as a result. And, and sorry, two more questions following on for that. How do you um, take into account things, for example, like agent-based backups, for example, which have an impact on a virtual machine over a time period? And that could be happening every hour, every 15 minutes, once a day. Yeah. So, so we can filter hours, and we also have a lot of mathematical control. And I'm not going to go too deep into this, but we have a lot of control over. We can build a model of the hours of the day and take a, you know, the, the certain percentile of that hour to carve out things that are that are uh, either non-recurring or kind of you know small in nature. Is that controlled by me, the user, or is that controlled by you? It's by you. It's, it's in the policies. So, okay. so, and I have an example later on towards the last section of exactly some tuning we're doing with one of our customers around exactly that. To say, well, how do I treat that workload that looks like this? What do I want to do with that? Do I how do I want to combine them? How do I want, do I want to resize it or not based on that? And it, it, once you've codified it in policy, it's very powerful because you can precisely tune exactly how the decisions are made in the environment for, for exactly the reasons you're, you're mentioning. So I won't go too deep now because there's, there's some stuff later on on that. I'll make can sure we get to it. Can you also add a Microsoft licensing intelligence? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yep. And that's covered in the last section as well. So I'll show you an example of that and the ROI. The, the, that's a fantastic example because the ROI is huge just for, just for moving workloads around, just for okay. moving VMs. Yeah. So um, just, to, just to, to finish this section, so um, what we need to do is look at this and say, well, we're going to step back and look at all of those shapes and sizes and patterns and kind of think this top down, not just looking at the last five minutes data, but the last 95 days of data, the last two years, whatever you want to choose, and say, if, we, if we're smart about this, we can put these together in a way that makes best use of the available resources and make sure the workloads get the resources they need at the time of the day they need it. So the risk goes down and the density goes up and we, we basically defrag the capacity. Um, and that tr tends to translate into a, a lot lower unit cost per VM. So everybody loves saving money. Um, I'll show an example of the savings later on, uh, one of our customers on, on that. If you're, if you're building a cloud, of course, unit cost is very important because you're trying to compete. If you have to compete with other offerings, then you, know, you don't want things to be twice as expensive as they, as they have to be. Um, and the things work better. And so how long do you actually analyze the data for before you make a decision about saying this VM should be right sized and take away some CPU from it or add some memory? It, it's, 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 again, it's, it's very diff, diff, carefully codified in the policy. So at least 95 days for a downsize. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to downsize. As a, I have an example showing exactly that. Upsizes you can do faster as long as you're sure that there's a, it's not a one-off you know, software installation on a Sunday afternoon. As long as it's a real trend, then you can upsize faster. So that's all, it's all in the policies. 
So I'll, 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 there's a section on that where I show an exact example of that. Thank you. And so, sorry to keep deferring these things, but I just want to make sure <laughs> we, we, we uh, stay on track. So that's basically you know, defrag or densification, as we call it. So um, you know, that's kind of the two levels we operate at. Within you know, what we call below the line, we can optimize the density, understand the dynamics of what's happening in those environments, and then at the higher level, make these macro decisions. So you can think of us as, as software that basically allows you to add detailed policy into the equation, um, analyze that uh, to great depth based on the policy, and then drive very specific actions about where things run. You know, some analysts call it best execution venue. Um, at the macro level, at the host level, the VM placement, uh, we can do localized rebalancing, global rebalancing, and then, and then things like demand management, which is important for a lot of our customers, saying, well, now I can actually make sense of that pipeline of demand. Uh, a lot of customers already ha even have that captured somewhere in ServiceNow or something. They just don't have any way to analyze it and say, how do I relate that to what I'm going to need at the bottom? And you know, a lot of analysts now say, I don't want to build the bottom and then figure out how to use it with the apps. I want to make the bottom driven by what the demands are. So I want to kind of go top down on this is kind of the, with the way we see things going, where the portfolio of, of supply is driven by the, the, the demands now and into the future that you're going to have. Yeah. All, the, all the policies that are written, are they written by the customers themselves or are they built in package policies for things like uh, PCI compliance or things like other geographical things or licensing things or something that VMware or IBM may recommend as the, the best way to lay out things? So, so we provide a bunch out of the box and I'll show you some in the demo. I'll pull one up and show you what it looks like. So we build in what we see our big customers doing. We know their overcommit ratios, that type of stuff. And PCI is, is a rule that's already in there if you turn it on. Um, so we provide that, and then there's a, usually a tuning exercise. Uh, it's not an onerous exercise. It's basically, how do you want this to operate? Um, because yeah. policies can, get, can take on a life of, of their own. In a complicated environment uh, like this, I, I wouldn't say that a, a single company would be using all of the things you're doing, but a potentially large portion of them, that policy engine can become extremely unwieldy. Yeah, well, so I, I, that's where I think it's important. It, it, has, its own, it has its own change control around it because it does govern how you do. Um, but it's not that complicated. People, at first when they hear policy, they think that sounds negative. But really what they realize is just codifying how you want to operate so it's not in everybody's heads. And they realize that if that person leaves, then we're, you know, we didn't write down what they know. So this is a way of capturing that. And it becomes a very high value area where then, then you can start saying, we need to cost a policy, for example. We say, um, did you know that your, that maximum limit on that, if you bump that up this much, you would save a million dollars in infrastructure or your overcommit ratio. Or so once you have that, you can start, you can start to use it to, to figure out where you're, your costs are, and a lot of our customers like to do that. We're, we call it cost of policy. Okay. And, and I, I suppose also a policy showback to someone like auditors who say, for example, that a sort, certain workload has to run on something in IBM software and some other workload has to run on a particular PaaS, you can show by policy that it, yep. it has to run in that particular yep. thing. absolutely. Re recent customer example, they had set up environments for Windows and Linux separately, and we just found, the policy found that there was two Linux VMs in the Windows pool and one Windows in the Linux pool. So they were Offside, it just could, that just comes right out of it. Once you have that in policy, once you said that's the way I want this to operate, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's nice to see that you can start with a set of those policies, like you said, from the analysis that you've done of best practices and other customers, and then take it to that next level just by customizing it to suit the specific requirements. You're not starting from scratch. Right, exactly. And so we want everybody to benefit from all these names I throw up, all these customers, that the next customer can benefit from yeah. what they've done because we've captured it and we know what works. Yeah. Um, and it's very much the, the dynamic. Um, okay, so, so basically, uh, let's just wrap this section up. So basically, we, we, um, we act like middleware, and this is another thing that people look at saying, okay, so, so how exactly do I adopt your product? Well, we kind of fit in between the, the things like the cloud manager platforms, the request consoles, and the infrastructure. And again, this is a, this is a, this is a much simpler diagram, but um, I'm going to show you our user interfaces when I demo it, but just think of it that if you've got it running and plumbed into the environment, you don't need to use the UI at all. It just kind of runs and choose on data, based on policy and generates actions. And, and you can just see the action automation occurring under the covers. Now another thing I wanted to hit very early on is, is um, the, before I get to the actual product demo, is, is uh, we talk about placement and people say, well, how are you different um, from things like VMware, you know, from DRS or VROPS or these things, or even VM Turbo? Um, and I've kind of talked a bit about that through the, the stuff I talked about earlier, but I found a, a fairly simple way to describe the difference between our approach and other products, and it's in robotic control theory. So just bear with me for a second. This is a diagram from a, a fairly standard uh, book on robotic control. And when you're controlling a robot, there's really different types of control. On the right-hand side, there's what you would call reactive or reflexive. 
and that's what they call sense react. Um, the analogy I gave, it's like on your car, the, the, the thing on the bumper that beeps when you're too close to a wall, that's kind of reflexive. It, it, just, it needs to respond quickly, but it doesn't need to really know where you're driving. It just needs to know you're close to a wall. Um, on the left-hand side is the more deliberative or symbolic or what we call predictive, and, and that's more like your, your nav system. I need to have a more complete world model. I need to understand those are one-way streets, and I need to know where you're going if I'm going to get you there, and traffic and all these things. So it's much more uh, uh, in-depth analysis. It's slower, so it doesn't respond as quickly, uh, but it's more goal-oriented. Um, and, and that's really you know, a good way to describe you know, what we are because, really, we are this thing on the, on the left-hand side. We don't operate in real time. Again, we, we like DRS running in the same environment as us, and it can move things in real time. So DRS would see a host getting hot based on five-minute data, move some VMs. Perfect. We would say, well, looking at your overall business cycle over the last two quarters, we're going to do this. And by the way, DRS shouldn't have to move things as much if we do this because we've anticipated the kinds of loads that we're seeing. And again, in robotic control theory, the best um, control systems are hybrid. They have a bit of both. You'd have, you have a, something planning, the actual, optimizing the actual process, and you would have a sensor so you don't bump someone with the robotic arm. And so that's kind of a, a simple way to think about where we fit in. We, we, we think a lot and we have a very complete model and a very complete policy model. And I'll, 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 I'll highlight these things. Um, and we do a lot of predictive analysis. So we try to see things before they happen uh, and prevent you from having to react once something's already happened. So can you, uh, do you, in addition to the automated predictive capabilities, do you have modeling capability to say that, okay, if I added three more of these or two more of those, yep. what would happen? Yep, and I can show you that in the, in the demo. So we have a full predictive timeline saying if I put two new blades in a week from now, if I take, take that data store offline a month from now, what does the picture look like? And it's a live model, so we can mm -hmm. actually, that's actually what will happen. And when you're doing bookings into it, it will, you know, it's like pre-selling a condo before you've, you've built it kind of thing. So it's full predictive modeling. And, and part of it is, is, is the predictive and also the completeness of world model. And, and Again, if you're, looking at a, if you're trying to build a self-driving car and you forget to put a corner or a camera on one side of it, you're going to run someone over. So you, can't, you have to have a pretty complete model of what you're trying to do in that kind of situation. The same is true of these environments that we analyze. I, I can't automate a decision unless I know doing that, you know, I can't put that VM with that other VM that's going to break a compliance rule. So you want a pretty complete world model. So when we talk about policy, that's the way of codifying that model. So um, you yep. use the word automate. What exactly do you mean by that? So we're not provisioning orchestration. We just generate very specific recommendations. Right. So based okay. on the data, this should be done. And then the policy says, where does that go? That should go to VMware. Uh, that, that, that can do a hot add. Or no, we don't have hot add. That should, do, that should go to ServiceNow. So the policy says where that happens. And I'll show you some flows of exactly how that comes okay. out of our product. So a, lot, a lot of times, we, we will just pass it to an orchestration system. So yeah, just to expand on that a little bit. So Initially, you, you know that a huge big workload is going to be coming at the end of the month that you're going to be spinning up another 10 virtual machines, for example, and server is going to say, well, the best place to run that is going to be IBM software for that component, and another, another bet is going to be another cluster running OpenStack, for example, or a VMware kind of cluster. Yep. But once you're running an operational, your, your tool is not going to do any moving things around, but you're going to hand off to, for example, vRealize Automation to say, now that workload needs to move from one data center to another data center, so you're not concerned with the technicalities of moving things around. You'll do the placement, and then you'll place recommend, have recommendations on where to move things, but hand that off to yeah, that's another a, that, tool that can do it. Exactly. So, so when you get into more of the complex, the complex orchestration tasks that might, might be involved in making those larger moves, for example, in, in a VMware NSX environment, we can, then, we can make recommendations across clusters because that can happen automatically in that environment. But if you're not in a, an SDN environment, then yes, that would require some kind of migration of data, for example. So, but, but how, so in the previous sheet, uh, for example, you showed that uh, I changed the policy and then a workload could potentially move from VMware into Amazon Cloud. Right. W okay, so that... So who, who is doing the move? Yeah, so, that, so we would make a recommendation that that's where that should go. We're not doing the orchestration of, of moving that. So that's where we so would I have to have my own tools to, to make that move. To do the orchestration. Almost all our customers have orchestration products. So we ICO, IBM Cloud Orchestrator, or VRO. Um, that's, and I'll show you some process flows of how we interact with those. So, so we're just coming up with the answer, and then we're kind of passing it back into the ecosystem. So, and that's a good segue to this slide where, you know, in a VMware environment, for example, you know, we interact with vCenter and DRS, uh, and we're doing integration with VR, vRealize operations. And VRO is usually the main point that we talk to as far as it asking us questions. And if you had a complex workflow, you know, that, it's that ecosystem that we're, we're not an orchestration engine. We're not going to say that needs to happen in that lockstep and, and, and uh, 
I need to image the OS on that machine. Mm. So the, using one of your terms, demand versus supply, one of, I think we keep going back and forth with a couple of different terms. We, sometimes we use the term VM, workload, application. Where's the, what, what am I basing policy off of? Am I built, basing policy off of application? Uh, and then if I am basing policy off application, can I go one step higher and not just base it off application, but base it off like business demand? So, you know, say that orders in China has increased 30% for this widget, what does it do to my system? Right. So, so the first one, so we, you know, the way I would characterize it, we, I'll show you in the demo, we can model an application, which is usually an aggregation of a series of virtual machines that then has a workload. I know some people use the word workload differently. So, so there's the utilization of VM is indicative of the overall, of it doing the workload, I guess. Um, so we can analyze those as groups, make decisions, policies can be at the VM or at the app level. Mm -hmm. um, we don't get into business metric correlation, so we don't say a, an uplift of 10% in your transactions causes this to the infrastructure, because that's a different kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. that's, there's a kind of other products that right. do just that. Um, but you can model that, if you know that, you can model that in our product. It's just we won't, we won't kind of do the, the correlation saying, well, that's a multi-threaded app and it's not going to scale that way. Right. Um, but we can take the result of that into the analysis. So in the demo, I'll show you the, the models of how we model at the VM level and at the app level. And service being, again, a kind of a, a, like an app, if you have a, a business service, it might be an aggregation of applications. Okay. So I'd like to so go back so, for yeah. a moment, if we can, just to the placement of a virtual machine, for example. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one of the biggest things for me is the network communication between virtual machines. So is that policy driven to say I've got a free tier application, for example, with a database at the back end, a bit of middleware and a web front end, and they've got to be on the same VLAN or some kind of access control list, but you're saying, hey, put this guy over here over in AWS, put this guy over here on your on-premises solution, how would you take into account the connectivity between those three different components? So, so we don't typically take something and spread it to the wind like that. Usually an app would be done atomically. Like the main, I'll show you in the demonstration, you can say, I want, I want these to go to the same place. Okay. Or maybe the database servers go to an adjacent database hosting environment is kind of another case. Mm -hmm. and, and we have what we call proximity. So okay. for example, I can say, this needs to go near where the rest of it already is. I'm mm -hmm. just deploying two more SAP modules. So don't put them anywhere, put them close to where they should be. Um, and that's where, again, that's where that, that customer advisor conference is very useful because a bank might say, I want it to be in the U.S., on the East Coast, near New York, but not within 30 miles of New York, but near my data feed, yep. you know, but not in the same cabinet as that thing. So, so there's, now, we, now that's a challenge to model that. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's something that we're working towards, but we do have what we call proximity modeling okay. like that. We don't do app latency, like we don't do pinging around to say there's app, you know, empirically do app latency testing. We, we've done integration, for example, with a Cisco product that does that, mm -hmm. um, if you want to add that into the analysis. Uh, but you can model proximity. So this very much is a logistics t tool. And are your partners, such as IBM, using this for period engagements where they come into a organization, large organization, and say, you know what, for three months or six months, we'll monitor your environment and then help you decide what goes into software. And then that's it for the tool and you know, kind of a pinpoint more of a razor type of tool versus a long standing solution. So, so that's not the way it's used. They, they use, our partners years ago used to use it that way because when they used to be focused on per, physical to virtual transformations, that was mm -hmm. a big thing. And that, that's, you know, that's kind of the mystery has gone in that. All these ones I'm talking about now and our partners are all long term, it's installed running as an operational component and it's a controller in the environment. So it's constantly getting data and making decisions. And it, so it usually works in the other direction. It's, 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 um, I'm gonna use that to basically um, <coughs> analyze my, my state and kind of de-risk it and, and densify it. And then I'm gonna start making routing decisions into it. So that the, that's usually the path it takes. Is, is first step is kind of densify and de-risk and then start doing routing and reservation on top of that. So you can use it in the other order. You can say, I just wanna do a what-if analysis and what your opportunities are. Um, but we, that's not where we focus as a company. We tend to focus on, on enabling it you know, it used to be that I need to figure out how to move, you know, these boxes from warehouse A to warehouse B. Now we're saying, don't do that one shot. Make warehouse B be self-organizing, and then figure, and then model those things into it. So, in this whole push to become a little bit more agile in deploying applications, you guys become the day two tool. Say, you know what, you you deployed it quickly. Now let me tell you how to manage it. Yeah, you could you can over so. 
for a brownfield environment, exactly, you've, you've got out there, you realize that there's a whole lot of uh, cost takeout that's possible mm -hmm. if you overlay this on. So a lot of the cases we see that, install this thing and it will, will sort that out. For greenfield environments, we're being plumbed in from the start. So it's kind of, that's, that's really the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And you can pretty much, you can see that clear delineation in all of our customers, that they'll have to be doing one or both of those things now where they're, they're driving efficiency in one environment and it's, it's kind of from the start of the next environment. It's, it's built in before they even open it up. Right. And I think that towards the end, there might be some use cases to talk about those, those things.